Just before Jesus went <coughs> back into heaven, he gave what is known as the Great Commission, <coughs> the great statement, the great command to the church that really defined what the church was to do. And not only what the church was to do, but what the church was to be. And the Great Commission, it is called, went like this. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Matthew's gospel puts it like, make disciples of all nations. And so that was what Jesus said was our mandate, our mission to go into the whole world to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to make disciples of all nations. That was an important statement that Jesus gave. And as that statement was made, we need to take it so clearly because often the church says, what are we on about? What are we meant to do? Are we meant to be in here or out there? And the reality is that the mission of the church is clearly defined. We are to be people who gather and to be motivated and taught and equipped to go, to be sent once. And that's a good way to understand our being as a church, we are sent ones for God, sent ones on mission for God. We are not to either be here or either be there. We are to be gathered to be scattered, gathered to be taught and equipped and encouraged and to have fellowship in order that we might go and share the good news of Christ with the whole world and make disciples of all nations. And so that is the incredible mission to which we have been called. And this year, our theme will be On Mission. Now, as I mention this theme, I'm not going to talk a lot this year about what the mission of the church is. We've done a lot of work over that for two or three years at least, and many times before that. We ought to know what our mission is. Rather, we're going to be talking about being on that mission on the mission that we already know that we have been entrusted. But lest it might be the case that some of us had a bit of drift over time and we've been distracted and just forgotten what is the mission of the church, let's quickly grasp it again, what the mission of the church is. And I came across a little clip that um, Brian Houston was speaking about on the church being on mission. So let's have a little listen to this and then we'll just wrap up very quickly on what the mission of the church is. And so in the everyday parts of life, all the events of life, the flashes of life, the dramas, the crises, interspersed is the church to be on mission. Essentially, the church is on God's mission. And God's mission is to set everything right, to d get an end to sin and all its consequences, to put it away and restore all people and all creation under the lordship of Jesus. That's God's great mission. We call the Missio Dei the mission of God, and the church is called into that mission that Jesus might be King and Lord of all. We are called into restorative participation with God in his great mission. God's big agenda is to bring everything under Christ that he might be head of all. The church is called into that mission and we are sent on that mission. And so we're not going to spend any more time this year going over that fact because that ought to be something already ingrained deep in our DNA. So the whole sense of us being a permanent part of God's mission program, always at work in mission, is this theme for this year, on mission. Are we on our calling? Are we who we are called to be? Are we being who we have been appointed are we on the journey? Are we sent like we have been sent? So that is going to be the sense of what we look at this year. And it's a real challenge because in many ways, churches are gathered communities, but they are not scattered communities. And this is the big challenge that we're going to face this year. There are a couple of things that propelled the early church on its mission. For a while, the disciples were that defeated lot they were not on mission. They were gathered and huddled together as a fearful band. But something propelled them on in their mission. And it was this, firstly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They saw someone who was alive, then died, come alive again. And it was this person who said to them, I'm going to send you and I want you to be part of my program. 
And so when you see a dead person rise again, it does give you some sense of, I want to be part of this. This is living. And it was the living Lord Jesus Christ that propelled the early church on mission, not just to be thinking about it, but actually sent ones. The second thing that propelled them was the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that the Christian life is meant to be a passionate spirituality. We are meant to be passionate about what God has called us to. And we can't do it by ourselves. We must be empowered for the mission that we are sent on. And we read this in the book of Acts. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Notice what the power of the Holy Spirit was given for, that we might be bold in our witness for Jesus. In Jerusalem, that is hometown, in Judea, that is the wide surroundings, and in Samaria and the ends of the world. Local, community in the neighbourhood, community in the nation, community international. We are called and sent on mission. And it can only happen if we have power for the job. We try and do mission in our own strength. We will fail and feel hopeless in the doing. You will receive power. The Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Now, this was all very well. The early church received that and they went in that power in the standing in the risen Christ, but they still encountered struggle. And if you are going to be on mission this year at Enfield Baptist Church, you too will encounter some degree of opposition, some pushback, some struggle, perhaps some persecution, definitely opposition. But there'll be great blessing in your life if you are truly on mission for Jesus Christ. Let's see what happened with these apostles. It comes from Acts chapter 5. Having bought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, they said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem by your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now notice what they were doing. They were filling Jerusalem with teaching. They were filling the community with the words of Jesus. Now Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead. So they announced the risen Jesus. That's the power they're living in. That you had killed by hanging him on the tree. And God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Power would come for being witnesses of these things. So as we look now at the theme for the year lying out before us, let us keep in mind that we need to be believing in the risen Christ. We have a risen Saviour, a living Lord. And secondly, we live in the power of the Holy Spirit that he might equip us and give us boldness to do what we cannot do in our own strength. So they were the two propelling forces for the early church to be on mission. Now, it is true that we need something to give evidence this year of whether we're walking on mission. And here are a couple of things we take from that passage which gives us an indication. If we are to be on mission this year, then for sure we will see people talking about Jesus more than anything else. Now, Mark, we do talk about the cricket a lot. We do talk about football a lot. But we need to be people who begin to talk more about Jesus. They filled Jerusalem with their teaching. They filled Jerusalem. They talked about Jesus more than anything. And so here's the first part of what we will look at on our on-mission theme, our words. We cannot be on mission if ultimately we do not share some words. That doesn't mean that the whole mission thing is about words, but at some point words must come into it. Michael Frost, who is very much a part of the missional movement, says that unexplained action is not enough. We do need to speak and give words to our belief in Jesus Christ. 
Now, some of you might get really fearful about that because, to be honest with you, the words part of it is where the church is the weakest. Perhaps here at Enfield, that would be true of us too. The words sharing of Jesus out there is perhaps where we are weakest. We are strong, as is the wider church, in demonstrating, caring, loving, engaging, connecting, embracing, showing, but when it comes to words, it's very difficult for many people to say what they believe about Jesus. It becomes a, a pullback. Someone says, well, I'm not an evangelist. You, you, you can't point to me and say, I'm a Billy Graham. Well, really, you're not being called to be a Billy Graham either. Uh, you're not being called to be a street evangelist. There are some people who simply aren't equipped for that. And this is the truth that when we come to words in mission, it's not necessarily about you having a public proclamation of the whole gospel. One of the encouraging things is that Paul describes there's two sorts of levels of words when it comes to being on mission. We have the gifted evangelist, the one who is given a gift by God to be able to boldly proclaim, to be able to present the whole gospel story, to call people to receive and repent and lead them to Christ. And they are called for that declaration, that bold proclamation. The Billy Grahams of the world, the other people who in our church community, we just see that they connect with people and share the good news easily. Those people are gifted evangelists. And then there's the rest of us, most of us, who are followers of Jesus. But we're called also to use our words. How? We are called to be prayerful and watchful and wise in our socialising and to give gracious answers for the hope that lies within us. Gracious answers. We are called to be connectors, communicating, watchful, and give a gracious answer of why you follow Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? It may not be that you can proclaim the whole gospel story to everyone, but you do have your own story. You have your faith story. Why did you come to follow Jesus? What does he mean to you? What difference does having Jesus in your life make in your daily existence? And if you can't sort of come to that conclusion, maybe do a little bit of work on that because you're a follower of Jesus. You're a disciple. You need to be able to know that story of Jesus and you. And you are called to give words to that story. You may not be able to do the whole thing, but you can do some of that. Now, here's a verse that might be of help to you. Be wise in the way you act towards others. Here's one way to be on mission. Be wise in how you act. Make the most of every opportunity. You get called into a certain group. You get called to an occasion. You're involved in a friendship. It's not just an opportunity to let pass. It is an opportunity to cultivate and to be wise in not missing that opportunity. Let your conversation be full of grace. Don't be a big-headed bigot or anything like that. Rather, be a person of grace. Let your conversation be seasoned with flavour, salt, so that, all of that, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And it says in other places that you might give a reason for the hope that lies within you. Why are you secure in life? Why are you confident for the future? Why aren't you gripped by the need to have more and more and more? Give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Because Jesus is my Lord and following him is my purpose. And following him isn't about getting more. We just heard it in the clip uh, we saw before and what Denzel Washington said. So there's a verse that I hope might help you understand that your words are very important as you give a conversation of your hope in Jesus Christ. The second thing that will demonstrate that you are on mission for Jesus this year is that you'll start to honour God above everything else. Now, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God, not you. And that understanding of life is going to be an important part of you being on mission this year. You find yourself in an ethical debate. You find yourself in a moral choice. You find yourself facing a, a 
answer to a situation that someone's asking you about. Who are you going to be formed by when you give your answer? We are going to be formed by something. We are going to be shaped by something. Either you are formed by your culture or Christ. Either you give an answer that's Christ or culture. The culture will want you to say something because it's politically correct and maybe it's not as hard. But you are to obey God rather than men. If you are to be on mission this year, you need to think through what does it mean to follow Jesus as Lord. That's about yieldedness. That's about surrender. That's about um, submission to his purposes. And so as we think about that, uh, being on mission is about our worship. That is our sense of who is the one that we honour? Who is the one that we lift praise to? Who is the one that we revere? Who is the one that we bow down before? Our lives, we're told in the Bible, are living temples, living places of worship. We need to be living on mission so that our lives are a bit like the moon. They are simply reflectors of the sun, shining out the glory of the sun. That's what we're called to be this year as we are on mission. And not only our worship, our words, our, our worship, but also our ways. If we are to be following Jesus and honouring God above all things, then what we do is going to be very, very significant. How we act, how our character shines out, what our attitudes are to certain things, what our reactions are, our responses to certain moments when people are looking at us, all of these things will be on mission moments. And if we are wise, as Colossians said, we'll take every opportunity to shine out in our ways the person of Jesus Christ, honouring God above everything else. So if we're people on mission this year in our worship, our words, our works and our ways, we are going to be honouring God above everything as well as speaking about Jesus more than ever before. And then there's a third thing, and that is that if we are to be on mission this year, what will be seen? We'll see people loving and caring for others more than anything else. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples, says Jesus. Now, you are called to love one another. You may not like one another, but you're called to love one another because love is not so much a feeling, it's a series of actions and attitudes and the ways you will see people and respond to them. We are called to love people more than anything else. And this will prove, said Jesus, to the world that you are my disciples. So purely a loving church, a church completely committed to encouraging, um, supporting and loving one another will be a witness to a broken world of how a community can operate. And I guess a good question is, are people actually saying anything about us due to our love for one another. In a world that doesn't really connect or connects in a very detached way, are people around us saying, look at those people at Enfield Baptist, look how they love one another. Is that what's being said? We have an opportunity this year for that to be a driving aspect of our being on mission. And that comes down to our works. What we do, our compassion, our sense of justice, our advocacy for those who are least able, our concern for a broken community and a broken world, all those things call us to action to be on mission for God. So we're on mission with our words, with our ways and our worship, and also our works. Now, Tertullian, who was an early theologian and um, was involved in apologetics, he said of those early Christians. Look how they love one another and how they are ready to die for one another. Now, as you look at that and see how significant the work of that local community was in loving each other such that they die for one another, and in the book of Acts chapter 2 and Acts 6, you see all the different things that they were doing for one another. When you look at that, how, how do we compare with that? Are we really ready to die for one another? Is our love for each other so great? Do you love the people you are with? 
And so this brings me back to something I've just got under here that I want to show you. <laughs> okay. A little bit of an undo shirt here. I love my church. Now, you might think John's gone a bit wacko since he's been to <laughs> Bangladesh and Vietnam and so on. Um, he's got a big egotistical about Enfield Baptist and sort of got focused on the church too much. And we don't really like people to talk too much and champion who we are. But I want to get this right. I love my church. I've been here for 20 years and I've invested, I believe, what is the best 20 years of my life into this church into God's church. The 20 years that, you know, we have in, you've got the same thing in that 20 years from 40 to 60, you've got the most productive time of your life ahead of you. Where are you going to invest it? What are you going to do? I've chosen to be here and you've chosen to have me here. I love this church. Now, the reason I love this church is not because just that you're a great group of people and have got great things going on, but because God, Jesus, loves this church. The reason I love my church is because I want to love what Jesus loves. And Jesus loves his church. He calls us his bride. He calls us the one that he died for. He loved us so much that he died on the cross for us. He loves us. And he's called this group that he loves on his mission. What a privilege. This is incredible. We are called as his partner to go on his mission. I love my church. And it seems to me that if we cannot say, I love my church, and this truth cannot be of us today, then we're unlikely to get on mission this year at all. Because the mission of God um, shines out from a church that loves each other. We've seen it so many times said in the scriptures. And the church is the one called on mission. And we need to love the church. What then, if I love my church, do I love about it? Well, I love the people of the church. God has placed each person in the church for his purpose. And I am to love that and love what God is doing and love why God has placed that person there. If I'm to love the church as Jesus loves the church, I'm going to love the service of the church. I'm going to love the fact, and we shared this in the first service as Jackie and Chris were here with us, that last week we had 16 junior youth when the year before, at the start of the year, we had virtually none. The problem with having 16 junior youth last week is we've run out of space. We've run out of teachers. We've run out of capacity to serve those kids in a significant way. And so last week, we had an on-the-spot meeting talking about how we're going to resolve that. What's God saying to us? Thank God that he's got those kids with us. Thank God he's equipped people. I love that. And we are called to love that too. And we turn to Chris and Jackie and thank them this morning for their ministry, what they are doing for God. But if we are to love our church, we're part of that. So we thank them, we thank Mel, we thank the kids ministry people and we pray for them. And not only that, we say to them, is there any way we can help? We love this. Can we help in any way? And that's the sort of thing that if we love our church, we find ourselves stepping into those places and thinking about practical help. Not just, well done guys, see you later. How can we be involved in what God is doing here. You've got to love your church, what God is doing. You've got to love giving. Now, that's something that we don't often love to do, but God has resourced us fantastically and God is blessing the church through the giving of the people. And very soon, David and the team who talk about property are going to come and present the challenge for this coming year on our property. God's given us facilities for our ministries, but we're already out of space with our facilities. But we have to pay off what we already have. We can't take next steps unless we are diligent in what we have. We are reaching so many people through all the facilities here, both in the church, in the hall, in the car parks, in the community partnership centre, in Lifewell, in New Beginnings. The properties are buzz with ministry. And we need to love it. Love it so much that we say, how can I be involved? I want to re-pledge what I had last year. I want to increase that this year. I want to bring other people onto the story so they can be part of it. If that doesn't happen, 
We don't go anywhere further. I want to love my church. And then I want to love sharing. You know, each week I see the bread table full out there and I see Martin bring all sorts of veggies and stuff and people load up and go home. That's terrific. But do you know what the reason for having that stuff there? Not for you to get cheap bread and cheap veggies. It's to share so that people get a bit of a glimpse of the fact that this church is about connecting with others. Take four or five loaves. Take the veggies, but don't just have for the self. Share it with somebody. Bring some awareness. And then say, thank you, Martin, for developing that garden. Thank you for what's happening in the ministries this year around the community garden. Thank you for what Jenny is doing in setting to seek up a whole lot of connection ministries out of the garden this year. I love my church. I want to get involved. I want to hear about it. I want to pop over and have a look at the zucchinis. You know, let's do it. Let's have a look at it and get a sense of what God is doing because I love my church. Why? Because Jesus loves what's happening. So this is not some egotistical rub you need to have. It is about what the church is. And I tend to feel if we don't get that, we are not going to get on mission this year. The church otherwise will be the place you come out of habit, the place you come out of tradition, the place you come for doing something that you have been asked to do, the place you come to maybe connect with friends, But that's not necessarily loving the church. And that sort of motive might actually bring in the end a little bit of embitteredness, a little bit of judgmentalism, a little bit of criticism, and some creeping in things that are not healthy. I love my church. Jesus loves the church. And so that is a posture I think we need to have a look at for a couple of weeks. What it is to love your church. Not for self-centred meism reasons, but because this is the body God loves and has selected to do what he's asked to be done, to be on mission. I love my church. Now, over this last week, the staff and some of the leaders of our areas met and we had a wonderful retreat time of prayer, planning and fellowship together. And these are some words that the group together came up with that they felt would represent a church that's on mission. And if these were not evident, it would be likely that the church is not on mission. And I think these are gold. These are terrific outcomes for that day. Firstly, prayerfulness, that nothing can be achieved without the power and presence of God. We can't be on mission without that being in place. Intentionality, recognising that without a clear purpose and planned action, it's possible to drift. This year, we could just end up at the end of the year exactly as we are now if we are not intentional about some aspects of mission that we need to see furthered and developed. Intentionality is so important. And in your ministry area, in what you do in your home group, whatever it is, will you be intentional about being on mission this year? Personal passion, you know, it's not, it's not going to get there by me, you know, sweating up here because I wore a T-shirt under here on a hot day for, you know, a whole service twice. I'll be stinking as I go out the door. It's not because of that. It's simply because it's got to be a personal passion. It's not about your leaders having the passion for you. It has to be each one of us together. A personal passion centred in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then engagement. The church is a body. It's called to collective mission. So it isn't the case that we just say, fantastic that we've got 16 kids busting the room out in junior youth. What are we going to do? How are we going to be engaged in that? How do we mobilise things to support that? How do we collectively get on the journey? Um, David had responded last week in terms of something we're going to put in the crash room, another divider there, just so on another point we can have a couple of spaces that we can create. You know, we are really crushed in many respects in what we have available to us now. But God's doing something. We need to love it and engage together on the solutions. Communication. Recognise we've got to be able to communicate and make sure we're all on the same page together. Connecting. No good as just being here for us. We need to connect with other people with genuine engagement in our community. And here's a very important one. A culture of commitment recognising that unless we are together committed to the call of Jesus, committed to the mission of Jesus and committed to being on mission, 
then we're unlikely to see outcomes for his kingdom this year. Now, here's one telling fact about church life today that the National Church Life Survey, Carl Fays, and other researchers say about mission, and it's true in the Baptist church too. You can grow a church twice the size and still have the only the same capacity as it had before it grew twice the size. You can grow a church twice the size and still have only the same capacity as you had years before when you were that same size before, when you, before you grew twice. Why is that? Because there is a tendency for a culture of commitment to wane and for attendance to be one out of four or two out of five. And if you have half of your people coming irregularly to the gathering, whilst they might be on the books, they are not present, they're not participating, they're not being, they're not belonging, they're not serving, they're not giving, and so your church hasn't grown at all. And so we could grow to twice as many as we are now, and if we had irregularity of attendance, because now we live in an options-based world, we've got all sorts of options out there, if we don't make Hebrews our commitment Forsake not, forsake not the gathering together of yourselves, as the manner of some is, but come together, gather on the Lord's day, and other things become second options to that. And if we had developed that as a committed body, everyone in attendance, then we start to see the church really growing in its capacities and strengths because everyone is participating, everyone is engaged. May I have the boldness to ask you, Wherever possible, and I know there are some exceptions, but whenever possible, make your first choice to be together on a Sunday at one of the two services. Make that your very first choice. And then a vision of God's kingdom, realising that God has a great kingdom in action and that we are broken people who are called to participate in his kingdom work. That's his mission, and we need to have that vision. So the kids' stuff happening is not just about, oh, we have a kids' program that's full. It's about God's mission being extended. I love that. I love my church. I want to participate in the challenges of what that brings. What can we do? And wouldn't it be great if the biggest problem we had in our church was people wanting to do more and more that we couldn't handle? I don't mean overloading ourselves. I mean taking more initiatives, taking more engagement, being involved where it's appropriate being more prayerful, more giving, such that Jesus said one time, and the Bible makes it clear that the, the storehouses overflow when people get that attitude of, I love my church. So where are you sitting with all that? Uh, is there a bit of pushback on that because it just sounds like it might ask more of me this year? Or would there be a genuine willingness to say, yeah, that's true. Jesus loves his church. And in fact, the only reason we're speaking this way today, this is the only option he's given to share with a broken world the good news of Jesus. We are option number one. What's the second option? There is none. Kajal, who is the director of compassion in Bangladesh, made this very clear to me one day. He said, compassion is not called to share the good news of Jesus. The church is. He said the social agency, the Baptist care, the global interaction, these agencies that are outside of the church gathered are not the ones called to share the good news of Jesus with a broken world. The church is. These are agents of the church. These are expressions of the church. These are part of what we support to do something on our behalf, but they shouldn't be seen to be out there. That's where mission is. The mission of God is to happen here. And through us, we support and enable other things to occur when they are beyond the capacity of these walls. We are the ones to be on mission. So Kajal from Compassion, he provides the resources for Ashish's churches, the churches to do the mission to their community. And that is how it ought to be. Really, it ought to be that Baptist Care is providing the resources for us all to do the work of mission. We shouldn't even have to have an agency, really. All the churches ought to be so active in connecting communities that uh, Joe Hubbard hasn't got a job. That's how much it ought to be. The church is the one called for that. Everything else is to support the work of the church. I love my church. 
I love my church because Jesus loves his church. I love my church because he loves service, giving, connecting, engaging. I love my church because Jesus loved it so much he died for it. And so I'm prepared to be committed to my church and help foster a culture of commitment and to encourage everyone to be on mission this year in words, in worship, in ways, and in works that bring glory to God and that Jesus might be seen as we are his witnesses. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as a called community, Enfield Baptist is not located here at all. Rather, Enfield Baptist is located right across this community, wherever we live. Wherever we're scattered, that's Enfield Baptist. That's your church, God, wherever we are located, in work, a play, a recreation, study, whatever it is. Help us be on mission in those places, alerting people to the presence of Christ, engaging with people of our story, our faith story. And God, as we embark this year on this theme, may you help equip us more and more so that we are more effective in this. Lord, we, we just are awed by the fact you would call us to participate with you in this great agenda, but you have. So help us now, God, as we go through this year to embrace what you're saying, to allow the challenge to hit home and to celebrate when we see new things and we take new steps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.